Hi, my name is Sarah Finkel and I work at our patio department here at Cornell Farm. If you've shopped at the patio before, you know that our pollinator buffet is one of our favorite sections and our staff is always happy to recommend to you plants that attract bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators. In today's video, I'm gonna talk about six more ways that you can create a really healthy and sustaining environment for those pollinators beyond just picking the right plants. So the first thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is water. Um, so just like you and me, pollinators need water in order to survive. Um, and one way you can do that really easily at home is by creating a water source. Um, so here I took one of our pretty um, glazed ceramic saucers and I added some rocks. And um, this just allows small insects like bees to be able to come in and drink water um, without drowning. Um, the rocks break up the surface tension and just give them kind of like a place to lounge from. Um, so you can recreate that at home really easily and um, just make sure to keep it refilled and wash it out as it gets dirty. Tip number two is gonna be shelter. And you might think of bees as nesting in hives, which a lot of bees do, um, but there are so many types of bees and so many different ways that they nest. So some bees nest in the ground, some bees nest in cavities, some bees build shelters, some bees dig them out. Um, so many different ways that bees create nests and that you can support um, their, their habitats. So um, one great way to do that is by providing grasses. Um, grasses are a way that nest building bees can construct their nests. And I've chosen two evergreen grasses. Um, so they're around all year to provide that habitat material. Um, this one here is a beautiful ornamental Carex prairie fire that we have at the patio. And then here is one of our native Carexes, Carex obnupta, that we have down here in the native section. Another way to support um, bee nests is by providing open clay soil at your home, which is pretty easy because most of our yards have a lot of clay already. But if you can just leave some small sections ungardened, that allows the mason bees to go in and get the clay that they need to seal up their um, cavities that they're nesting in. And of course, you can also choose to provide a mason bee home, and we sell a variety of them here. Um, this is a really cool model that I like. Um, because this one is um, in sort of layers of tubes, so these just all open up and make it super easy to clean, which is one of the most important things to know if you are going to provide mason bee housing that it does need to get cleaned and sanitized yearly. So speaking of bees and nesting, tip number three is about spring cleanup. Um, when we get those rare sunny days in the winter and spring, it can be so tempting to run outside and cut back all of last year's perennials. But um, because so many bees nest in hollow stems, if you go through and cut all that out and throw it away, you could be literally throwing away your bees, which you don't want. Um, so I urge you instead to wait um, to do your cleanup until the daytime temperatures are consistently in the 50s. Um, in the meantime, you might find other garden projects to do um, when you're feeling inspired on those days. Um, and there's also a really cool added bonus that if you're leaving lots of last year's plants with seed heads on them, that will attract some really cool birds and bird watching to your yard, which also helps your um, garden ecosystem. Tip number four is bloom time. So just, important, just as important as picking plants that attract those pollinators, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have flowers blooming year round which will provide a year-round food source of nectar and pollen for those pollinators. And the unfortunate news, if you were wondering, is that there's not one flower we can recommend that blooms for 12, 12 months out of the year here, but we're happy to help you put together combinations of plants so that you can have year-round blooms even in a really small space. So I'll demonstrate some examples. Camellia is one of our favorite options for winter blooms. Um, they're totally gorgeous and they cover blooms when not a lot of other things are flowering. Candy tuft is a great choice for kind of end of winter going into spring. Our native red flowering currant is a beautiful option throughout spring that you see all over town. And then there's lots of great choices for spring going into summer like centranthus and lavender. And then our salvia is going from late spring throughout the summer and into fall. And then you've got those heat loving plants that start blooming midsummer and bloom throughout the fall, like coneflower, black-eyed Susans, and asters. And one of our absolute favorite plants at the patio is geranium roseanne, which blooms about as long as any perennial does here um, and can easily bloom for half of the year, if not more. 
And we've already touched on it, but um, it's so important it gets its own tip. Tip number five is using native plants. According to the latest report from the Oregon Bee Atlas, there are so far 650 known different species of native bees here in Oregon. And the scientists believe that most of those bees rely on just one or two or three or a few different species of native flowers for all of their nectar and pollen needs. So the more different native species you can incorporate in your garden, the more different native bee species you can support. Another added benefit of using native plants in your garden is that they will be more adapted to um, our climate and our soil. So we're here in our native plant section, um, which is a great place to find a huge selection of native plants. And our staff is always happy to help you pick one that might be good for your spot. Um, so I brought out some native penstemon, camas, um, our native yarrow, which is one of my favorites because it's got such a long bloom season, um, native columbine, and of course the Oregon grape, our state flower. And lastly, tip number six, perhaps the most important tip is minimizing your pesticides use or using pesticides cautiously and as a last resort. Um, there are so many steps you can take to have healthy and pest resistant plants proactively and our staff are happy to talk to you about all the ways that you can support that. Um, as pest issues do arise, um, there's a lot of physical measures you can take to start dealing with those. For example, a strong blast of the hose is the first way that I always deal with aphids before I go spraying anything else. If you are turning to remedies, it's important to bear in mind that just because something is organic doesn't mean that it doesn't have the potential to harm beneficial insects along with those pest insects. Um, so it's really important to read the instructions, do your research and know what the, um, what the outcomes might be. And then you also wanna take steps to protect beneficial insects from whatever you've applied. So a great way to do that is by using row cover after you've applied um, a remedy, just so no one is landing on it that you didn't want to land there. So today we talked about six different ways that you can amplify your um, pollinator habitat in your garden. Hopefully you got some good ideas. And if you have any more questions, want more information, or want to shop for some new pollinator plants or supplies, we're so happy to help you at Cornell Farm. Thank you for watching.